My name is uh, Marlon Blackwell. Uh, I'm the principal of Marlon Blackwell Architect in Fayetteville, Arkansas. A small critical practice uh, that's practicing both locally, regionally, and nationally. Uh, we have a staff of eight full-time uh, uh, persons and uh, a couple of part-time uh, and do a wide range of projects, everything from something as small as a, you know, a, a house for a, a beekeeper uh, to draw honey from all the way up and to the new architecture school for the, uh, the local university. Uh, so we're operating under the assumption that uh, architecture can happen anywhere, uh, at any scale, and perhaps at, at, uh, at any budget. So it's something we firmly believe in. Uh, I find that uh, it's important, I think, as practitioner to find ways to bridge the gap between academia and the professional world uh, and so I wanted to start my practice uh, uh, and make teaching part of the practice of architecture uh, so I am a full-time uh, professor distinguished professor I'm also the department head at the University of Arkansas School of Architecture uh, it's been a vital part of uh, you know, uh, how I see the world, how I maintain vitality in my practice, uh, uh, because there's a constant exchange of ideas, and you also have to continually reevaluate uh, your own positions uh, about design and the role of architecture and the language of architecture. Uh, and what I find teaching does is allows for a continual evolution uh, of ourselves as an, as an architect, or, but also as an architecture firm, but ultimately a continual evolution of our architecture and how we might achieve architecture in the fullest sense of the word. Uh, so it's, it's absolutely critical. And what I found is, is that it also keeps you honest in the sense that Students can tolerate many things, but they don't tolerate people who practice and do bad buildings. So you have to do good work. It's what provides you credibility in the institution. Um, and simultaneously, it gives you the opportunity to practice what you preach. Uh, and I think that's absolutely critical. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as a teacher, I think it's important uh, to stay away from emulation from your students. Uh, the key is to have the students find their own identity, uh, to learn how to question, learn the beauty of questions um, that have less to do with uh, the answers you're already beginning to provide in your own work, as well as those questions, but more to do with the questions they find in any sort of situation. So the great thing about teaching right now is that given all the different modes and opportunities for practice, the best thing that we can do is to instill agency in our students, the capacity to act in the world on any type of project. More and more architects are being asked to put together uh, uh, multidisciplinary projects, uh, or excuse me, multidisciplinary teams, uh, that are using design to resolve for things that architects never really dealt with that much before. Infrastructure, uh, the urban condition, uh, the residual, the, the ruburban, uh, uh, buildings, yes, of course, buildings, fabric, uh, furniture, everything. So uh, the idea that you have a conceptual agility uh, is very important to operate in the world today. Uh, it's tough to be monolithic, and that's something we strive for in our students is to develop uh, and instill agency, that confidence, that capacity to act uh, when faced with a challenge. When I was a young student, I read The Fountainhead, 
and I believed every word of it. Uh, the power of the individual, um, the noble savage fighting against the world. Uh, as I've begun to evolve, both uh, as, an, as a, a student of architecture, an architect, and as a, as a, as a person, I've begun to realize that increasingly an architect is no longer just the author of a single work, but is increasingly more than that, it also the author of processes, uh, strategic processes by which work uh, emerges. And so the idea that uh, they develop ways in which work can happen, uh, ways in which uh, we can insert design into every aspect of our lives. Uh, I think uh, uh, increasingly that's the role of the architect to simultaneously to be a leader in the design field but to be very uh, collaborative in the way in which they work. Uh, increasingly I find myself putting together multidisciplinary teams uh, we're currently working on a project in Pittsburgh for uh, the Point State Park, the redesign of the portal there. We're, you know, we're involved with a sculptor, we're involved with a lighting uh, specialist, we're involved with uh, uh, ecologist, we're involved uh, with, uh, the, of course, the engineering uh, and landscape, and all of these working simultaneously at the origins of a project. No longer uh, the architect you know, establishes uh, all the direction and then people fall in line. It's something that happens more in real time at once. So yet we uh, have to have the ability to orchestrate, to direct uh, the process and to be able to interface with all the different stakeholders in a process, in a project. And I think that's really uh, key as well. So I don't know that it, how radically different it is, it's just that I think uh, we are raising now as architects the expectations of society of architects, you know, by example, by what we do, by no longer being, uh, you know, passive about, well, we'll do a building and then we'll move on. Now we want to affect the city. We want to affect uh, our own places. Uh, we want to operate locally, but we want to be part of the global uh, conversation. Uh, so it's increasingly, I think, the best architects are closing the gap between the universal and the local uh, in, in how they operate. Uh, again, it gets back to the capacity to act in the world in, in, in almost any situation. I think, for one, we are a critical practice, and at times we can be an experimental practice. Uh, we work on a variety of projects, some of the most modest projects you can imagine, and occasionally we have the chance to, uh, you know, do something much larger scale, maybe a larger budget. But what we try to do is find opportunities to innovate, to question in every scenario. In some cases, it only may be in the context of elements, doors, windows. Uh, we try to look at details as a source of uh, for innovation. For us, details are spatial propositions. Uh, so they're not merely an assembly that facilitates uh, some kind of aspect of the construction, but in fact are something that can be uh, deeply experienced. So even if we have a project that may be $100 a square foot, we're going to look for an opportunity uh, to, to innovate, to maybe to develop a detail at the corner that is seamless, uh, that elevates uh, the most prosaic of buildings to the status of something that could be considered high architecture. So it's the innovation can happen in logics and the development of material logics, formal logics that develop a kind of resoluteness in the work. And I find that uh, very important because that only comes from a deep uh, line of questioning uh, by asking the question, we ask this question on every project in every scenario of the project, 
how might it be otherwise? Uh, and I think that's, that's key to generating innovative possibilities in the work, uh, no matter what kind of work. It could be, uh, oh my gosh, we, it could be a garage. Uh, it could be uh, a chapel. It could be an embassy. It, you know, you should not be limited by the size of the project, the budget, or uh, where it is. The, it's all possible. My instincts have always been to network. Uh, one of the things I, 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 I learned in teaching with Peter Eisman, I taught for a year with Peter, and he always used to say to students, and, and, and to me as well, is that the best thing that you can learn while in school is to know enough to know that you don't know. And that really stays with me because I increasingly know that there are all these possibilities out there that every person I meet, that every situation I enter into develops another uh, uh, kind of uh, another layer, another connection that helps me, uh, that helps provide potentially insight on to this search uh, for true things, this you know passionate and patient search for true things. And, and architects, uh, people, places are all part of that world. They're all interconnected. And so I'm not, I never always feel like I'm not just networking with people. I'm networking with the world when I travel. You know, uh, I'm networking with a place when I begin to draw and speculate in a particular place to document it. Uh, but I'm very interested uh, as a teacher that students begin to develop the desire to master the language of their discipline, the language of architecture, uh, the universal language. It's there. Uh, and I think in order to do that, you need to know architects. You need to know architecture. Uh, you need to know the history of your own discipline. Um, I think I also have the desire to be influenced by the best. Uh, so I'm very interested in looking at architecture from the beginning of time to experience the, the culture of you know, the Maya, for example, or the Inca. Uh, those are powerful moments. That's a form of networking, I think. Um, but, and of course the canon, the, the great modernist. But there are so many architects that I've learned so much from uh, just by spending a, a little bit of time. Uh, I helped uh, lead a lecture series uh, when I started teaching. I immediately brought in Herzog and de Muran, uh, uh, Peter Zumthor, Robert Irwin, the artist, uh, uh, Griel Marcus, the rock and roll uh, writer. I mean, spending two or three days with these people, uh, yes, you get to know them, they get to know you a little bit, but what they, you, what they share in terms of ideas is exponential in terms of your own growth. Uh, so, you know, networking can be in the moment, it can be over a period of few days, it could be a period of few years. But the, what it brings to the table in terms of your own overall understanding or development of your own body of knowledge uh, is immeasurable. Uh, so I, th I think I enjoy just uh, learning, I enjoy from others, you know, I enjoy uh, understanding their own struggles and passions they have about their work, I, and it's something that we share. So it's very important. I don't, I don't think, I think it's very difficult to be an isolationist. I don't believe it. I hear it, but I don't believe it. When somebody tells me, oh, I don't, I don't look at anything, I don't say anything, I, I always feel like they're trying to convince me that they're some sort of idiot savant. I, I don't believe it. I think the best architects I know, they're very interested in the world around them and they're very interested in other architects. It doesn't use the computer uh, to draw. I mean, I still draw with a piece of charcoal or a, I'm like a caveman, <laughs> you know, a, a piece of graphite. That's what I, that's my what I channel my ideas through. Um, the internet has uh, obviously begun to affect uh, 
how we work. And of course, I, I want to make the distinction between the internet and the computer, but nonetheless, they're inevitably linked uh, in some way, uh, in many ways, actually. I think being a neo-Luddite, I, I rejected the internet at first because it was impersonal in my mind. Uh, I'm the kind of person I don't like to email to communicate. Uh, I will do so to, in a very cryptic way, but I like to talk to people by phone. I like to meet people uh, in person. But simultaneously, uh, for us, the Internet is a great resource for language. When we talk about how we use language to, uh, to describe architecture, to describe situations, and for me to help fully understand language, I can always Google, you know, and, and get definitions and get uh, connections this way. I, I, uh, uh, I might be interested in a particular building and I might kind of know where it is and sort of what it looks like and I, I can be, my thinking that is cryptic can be documented in a cryptic way on the internet and the internet connects me to something precise. It focuses and it's like, wow, it completes a thought. It completes a question, and that's something that has become increasingly a resource for me personally. Uh, and and how we uh, kind of operate in the firm is to increasingly it becomes more interchangeable. You know, with you know we work. Uh, I don't know, David. I don't know how to say it exactly, but it's uh, interchangeable. is not the right word. Maybe it's. Uh, integrated, you know, and in, 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 in how, how we work. So um, I have to say, honestly, I, 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 I like the Internet very much relative to architecture in terms of being able to move through time, you know, uh, backwards, forwards. It flattens time uh, uh, at times, no pun intended, to, you know, find connections uh, to particular projects or situations and to know that again you know if if I'm practicing in a relatively remote part of the US the Ozarks uh, and I can find out about work from somebody else that's in you know Botswana that's a pretty incredible thing that I could couldn't originally do through the print media on the other hand I have to say uh, as a counter to the internet I still very much value the print media, but I'm seeing um, more and more uh, the value of both. So, for our, for example, our own projects, uh, we love for them to be, especially if they're peer-reviewed, if they're reviewed, we know that it's not just mere, merely a channeling of information, but in fact it's evaluated and the work is deemed worthy of being put out there. Uh, we quite like the internet as a resource to put our work into the world, but I'm still very much a fan of the print media as well because it's tangible and uh, what I don't know yet, and you can help me with this too, is I know that in the editorial rigor still exists in the print media. For me, it's yet to have been proven in the internet uh, relative to the work. And that's something I can be enlightened about. But I I, I, it's a question I have, how rigorous is the uh, editorial review of something uh, that goes into the, the digital world, a project, versus the, uh, the print world? Um, perhaps I, maybe I have more experience with the print world, and that's, that's the case. But the internet in our office has, uh, well, you know, it's also the way we communicate with each other uh, via our drawings in the office. And it, does anybody ever say that? I mean, you, you have to have the internet, you know, the networking to share your drawings. So that's, right now, we're, we changed our business model about three years ago where we're willing to collaborate with other firms on projects. If you're modeling three-dimensionally through BIM in real time, how do you, how do you share information simultaneously? So. The internet allows for that, be able to network, to communicate uh, in a three-dimensional model 
simultaneously and you make a change and the change happens and so all those things are integrated now so when I see internet or when you say computer it's or the digital computation it's hard to in some cases pull them apart because it comes a, a, a way of channeling uh, your drawings. Then it's a question of cultural infrastructure, you know, a, a kind of place to be. Uh, who, who are your friends? Uh, who, who, who are you influenced by? You know, I, I, I said earlier, I think students, whether they realize it or not, have a choice of being influenced by the best or by the worst. Uh, so I always suggest to students uh, what institution you want to go to, find out about who teaches there, first and foremost. Um, I think if it's a first professional degree, make sure that you have teachers who are also practitioners. I think a school has to have great scholars and great practitioners uh, to be a holistic a kind of education, especially if it's a professional program. I, I, I don't think a professional program can be run strictly by academics uh, uh, who have never practiced. I mean, that, that's, that's crazy. Uh, any more than I believe uh, a school could be run by professionals with no academic training. I mean, that's, that would be crazy too, I think, at a certain level. But, um, so there, there is this careful balance. So uh, I, think, I think it's really about the faculty and, and how productive the faculty are, what their interests are. Is there an alignment with your interest? Uh, I think is, is key to uh, choosing a school. I once uh, I have a good friend and mentor who's since passed away, E. Faye Jones, who was a, a very famous architect who was a, a student of Frank Lloyd Wright who went on to win the AIA gold medal in uh, 1990 uh, and has designed Thorn Crown Chapel, which is considered to be, uh, well, I think by the AIA considered it the fourth best building built in the 20th century uh, in the U.S. I asked him one day, I was visiting with him his home, he's in his 80s. Uh, I said, uh, Faye, I said, you know, you practiced for nearly 60 years. I said, how do you, you maintain such consistency, such a great body of work? I mean, it's like, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing how you did that. And he, he said, well, it was quite simple. He said, I decided to start my firm the way I wanted to end my firm. He said, you don't wake up at age 50 and decide you're going to do good work. He said, every project is an opportunity and you commit yourself in a very principled way uh, to make architecture and to know your discipline and to know the language of architecture and, and know how to respond. And you don't compromise your principles. You can compromise on budgets and things like that, but you don't compromise your principles. So that's key to starting it, first and foremost. Your business plan has to include that, I believe. Um, because uh, the market may say something else, and you have to be able to respond to the market. Uh, you have to find a, a means, a path, which can allow you to, to make this principled response, no matter what the challenges may be, economic, cultural, personal. Uh, so that's very key. Uh, if you don't start well, I don't think you necessarily end well. Uh, so that was one of the things. I came from a, a very uh, uh, modest background. We had my family very low middle class, so I had no connections no money uh, independently, uh, no pedigree uh, from an institution like Harvard, what do you do? So I practiced for 10 years in other firms. Uh, I then decide, you know, perhaps I can teach and practice. I can find a way to contribute to the academy and to develop a small practice doing one or two projects a year. So by the time I die, eh, 30, maybe 30 good projects. That would be a good life, 30 really good projects.